Last Sunday, we talked about waiting well. Today, we're going to talk about what to believe while you wait. What to believe while you wait. And next Sunday, the Lord willing, we'll talk about worth the wait. It was worth the wait. So Advent is a season of waiting. I remember my first job, or one of my first jobs, when I became a teenager, I uh, started saving some money, and uh, I had a brother-in-law that said, uh, he um, said, if you need a car, said, I have, uh, I have a car that you can buy for, it was relatively uh, cheap. And so I did purchase that car from him, but the thing about that car was that it was a senior citizen's kind of car. Sorry for the senior citizens here, but I was a teenage guy, and uh, it was a, it was a uh, 1983 uh, Chrysler Fifth Avenue four-door. Okay, so if you're anything related to those, it was a senior saint's car if I, in my book. Um, and uh, it just didn't fit me. Um, and so I, uh, I began looking for another vehicle, and I had a friend at work that said, hey, I got a buddy that's uh, looking to sell his, his truck. And uh, so I went and looked at it, and, uh, man, I, I really liked that truck. It was a 75 Chevy. It had uh, 350 four-barrel uh, dual exhaust. Uh, just sounded like my kind of truck, if you know what I mean. And low-profile tires, and it's just just some nice rims. And uh, I said, uh, "This is it." And the price was right. And uh, I just really got so uh, excited. I was looking forward to making the purchase. And then when I talked to uh, the buddy again, he was like, "Well," he said, "The problem is." He says, one of my buddies has said he would like to buy the truck, but he needs till Friday to come up with the money. And I remember waiting that week until Friday. It was the longest week of my life. I was praying, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, but don't give him the money. <laughs> don't let him get the money. <laughs> that was bad, I know. I know. But uh, I remember uh, that was the longest week. Why? Because... Waiting is not what we as Americans like to do. And I mentioned last week that not just us, but the whole world rushes past Advent simply to get to Christmas. But Advent is a season that teaches us to wait and hopefully wait well like we spoke last Sunday. So it's our nature uh, to despise that word wait and and rather, we, we kind of gravitate and we, we worship basically at the uh, uh, altar called instant because instant being the opposite of weight. And uh, <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, if you was to look around in our culture today of all the advertisements and books that actually have the word instant in their title, uh, you would really see... Uh, that we have as Americans, we have two national obsessions. We have uh, an obsession of weight loss and making money, okay? And no one in America wants to lose weight the old-fashioned way by eating right, exercising more, dropping a few ounces every day. Listen, step by step, right foot, left foot. It's a journey, isn't it? We want to lose weight, and we want to lose it yesterday. And, and if you see some of the titles of the weight loss books, I mean, uh, these are real titles. Uh, there's one out that's called Instant Weight Loss, and here, here's, the, here's the description of the book. It says, open the box and lose nine inches off your waist. Really? Open the box and lose nine inches off your waist. Another one, title of another weight loss book, Dear God, Let Me Lose Fat Now. Amen. And it goes on to say how eight minutes in the morning, eight minutes in the morning will bring easy weight loss. 
guaranteed to shed two pounds a day. No equipment required. No calorie counting. Man, doesn't that sound good? See, Grandma told us that if we do things the right way, it's going to take time and hard work. But we say we want to lose 20 pounds now, and we'll do it by that latest detox super colon cleanse. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Same thing regarding money. Just Google. Get rich quick. Google that phrase. Amazon will give you like 8,000 titles. Here's some of the titles. Here's a book called Go to Sleep and Wake Up Rich. I know that's why some folks sleep on my sermon. Here's another one. How to get one million people to give you a dollar. It's a step-by-step process to instant wealth, it claims. Boy, I just love reading these instant book titles. Here's another one called Instant Peace. Two-minute meditations that will create a lifetime of happy. So rather than do the hard work of forgiving people and the hard work of filling our mind with truth, do the hard work of breaking habits that are robbing us of our peace, we can get peace on the cheap in two minutes. Really? Well, wake up, Alice. How many know this is in Wonderland? The season of Advent is uh, helpful, I think, in every area of our lives. And so whether we're talking about uh, emotional health or financial wealth, uh, weight loss, relationships, or whatever, Advent, Advent is, is the season that teaches us how to wait and hopefully wait well. So today, we're continuing this series, and my question is, what are we to believe during this season of waiting? Because here in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah is, as much as we want him to be the center of the story, how many know he's not? God is. Zechariah and Elizabeth are waiting, and they're waiting for years for a child that never came. More importantly, they are waiting for God to fulfill His promises to the nation of Israel to deliver them from the hands of their enemies. Let me ask you this morning, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting for? Some of us may be waiting on a loved one to turn to the Lord. Maybe some of us are waiting on a loved one to get free from an addiction. Maybe we're waiting on a loved one to come back to Christ. Maybe it's a prodigal son or prodigal daughter. There are those of us who are waiting for uh, maybe some physical healing, whether it be for ourselves or for a loved one. Some of us are waiting for the companion that we've been praying for to do life with. Or maybe you're praying to uh, get a better job, one that you really love. Maybe you're waiting for God to heal a marriage. Maybe you're waiting to get out under a certain debt. What? What are you waiting for? Turn to a neighbor and say, what are you waiting for? During times of waiting, those of us who know the Lord, if we are not careful, we began to believe certain lies about God while we wait. And one of the keys to waiting well, which is what Advent is all about, is having our hearts filled with, not lies, but with truth about God. And and during times of waiting, though, it's sometimes hard to continue to believe the truth. So I want to share with you some of the lies that we begin to believe while we wait. And I'm going to share three of them. Here's the first one. Lie number one. We begin to believe this, that God is not doing anything while I wait. So we first meet Zechariah here in the temple. And notice with me, uh, if you still got your Bible open, God makes Zechariah a very wonderful promise. 
He and his wife Elizabeth, who have been unable to have a child, will miraculously conceive in their old age. That is the angel's promise. Zechariah hears the promise of the angel, but his reaction is one of unbelief. So the angel has to dish out uh, some judgment on him, which we find was the loss of speech. And so, oh, brother, Zechariah's mouth was muted here in verses 18 through 20. And have you ever wondered why Zechariah experienced that particular judgment from the Lord? Why did his unbelief result in him not being able to speak? Why, when his son on the eighth day after birth was presented by his father and mother to the family for John to be circumcised as all Jewish boys were presented publicly on the eighth day, why was it then and only then that Zechariah was able to speak again? See, the judgment on Zechariah of silence of speech, I think, is a sign to the people of Israel. In fact, Zechariah himself was a sign because after the Old Testament uh, prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the prophetic voice of God went, what? Silent. For how long? Somebody tell me, 400 years. For four centuries, people were waiting for a word from God. And when people are waiting, they begin to believe that God is not doing anything. How many in here has ever felt that way? You don't have to raise your hand. God's not doing anything in my life. God doesn't seem to be saying anything. I pray and I pray, but nothing happens. What Zechariah didn't know and what people of Israel didn't know was that at the very time They thought God was doing nothing. During those 400 silent years, God was on the move. Hello. God was actually preparing the world to receive his son. You ever wondered why God sent Christ at that particular moment in history? Why then and not a hundred years before or a thousand years later? Why did God choose that particular moment to send his only son into the world? I want to share with you five precise reasons why Christ came at exactly the right moment in history while people thought God isn't doing anything. While God was mute, in a sense, while he was silent, God was actually setting things up. So the world could be saved through the proclamation of the gospel of his son. You see, a century before Christ was born, the world, the existing world at that time, was being torn apart by war. Civil war raged across the entire Roman Empire. But just a few years before Christ was born, peace was finally achieved. It was called Pax Romana, which was Latin for Roman peace. And this peace, this Pax Romana, lasted for the next century and a half. And because of the military peace, there was enough stability in society for the gospel message to be spread easily. So that was number one. The second thing was, was that there was Roman roads. There, has, there was never a time in history until the 1800s when it was easier to travel through the entire Mediterranean world than it was at the time of Christ's birth. An amazing road system connected the entire Mediterranean world, all of North Africa, and the way through the Middle East into Europe from Turkey to Spain. And so Christian missionaries could take the gospel message and travel from place to place. And that's exactly what we see happening. So that's the second thing, the Roman roads, the Roman peace. And here's the third thing, a common language was needed. You know, one of the things that missionaries face when they go to another country is having to learn a whole new language. And it takes years sometimes for missionaries to learn enough of the new language to be able to interact well with the natives and more, be able to preach the gospel in their native language. But this time in history where the entire Mediterranean world knew Greek, it was their second language. 
And people may have spoken Aramaic in the promised land, Latin or in the western Mediterranean, but virtually every educated person also knew Greek. And the Old Testament had been translated into Greek. And when the first apostles went out preaching, they didn't need to spend years learning new languages. They could just go and speak Greek, and they were understood by everyone just about. And so here's the fourth thing, spiritual hunger. At the time of Christ, people had lost faith in the old Greek and Roman gods. Religion had failed them. Philosophy had failed them. The whole world was looking for some spiritual answers. The fifth and final thing is that Jews were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. So people with the knowledge of the Old Testament were everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. So there was a foothold in virtually every city where the gospel went of people who knew of a one true God. And the Jews knew the story of creation. They understood God's ways and knew the prophecies concerning the Messiah. And they now uh, could hear about the fulfillment of the prophecies in Christ. Friend, during your season of waiting, do you believe God is doing nothing? You need to believe this right here this morning. God is on the move. Hello. I said, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh, you got to say it like you mean it. Neighbor. God is on the move. One more time. Neighbor. God is on the move. Listen, God is on the move in your life. He's in the, on the move in your family. He's on the move in your world. Let me go back to someone I mentioned last week in the Old Testament in regards to the topic of God doing something for us and in us while we wait, and that is Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. Because Abraham's humanity and how he sometimes doubted God's timing when he was stuck in the waiting room is something that I can identify with. Abraham even tried to fulfill God's promise on his own timing through Hagar. Remember that story? What a dysfunctional disaster that was. Perhaps Abraham thought God needed his help. Perhaps God needed his ingenuity. And that is what I can identify with. Abraham's struggle with impatience feels all too familiar to some of us. If we're totally honest. Hello. <laughs> Too many times we've tried to help God fulfill his plans. That is, the plans I'd like for him to have for me. Hmm? Plans that I would give him for me. I deserve God. You should do this for me. Listen, as we study the book of Genesis, we see that while Abraham was waiting, God was working. What do you say? I say, while he waited, God was molding his character. God was teaching him patience. God was building their friendship. It was in the 25-year wait between the promise and its fulfillment that Abraham actually got to know God intimately. It was in the seemingly wasted years of waiting that God transformed Abraham. And after that time of waiting, Abraham was ready for the supreme test of his faith. When he was asked to take that son that had finally came after 25 years of waiting, take him and sacrifice him. Oh, but wait, God, he's the son of promise. He's the son I've been waiting for. See, Abraham's faith wasn't rooted in the promise of descendants. If it was, he would never have taken Isaac to be sacrificed. He wouldn't have uh, relinquished that God had promised him years earlier, what God had promised him years earlier. He would have clung tightly to Isaac and said, Oh, no, Lord, mm -mm. you gave him to me. You ain't getting him. He, he didn't feel entitled to his son, for Isaac was the fulfillment of God's long-awaited promise to Abraham. But yet Abraham had learned. And Abraham wasn't clinging to his own understanding of the fulfillment of God's promise. God could fulfill his promise any way he chose, including raising Isaac from the dead if he had to. 
So ultimately, Abraham's faith lay in the trustworthiness of God. Abraham's faith wasn't in the promise alone. His faith was rooted in the one who made the promise. And because his faith was not in what God would do for him, but in God himself, Abraham was willing to risk. He could do whatever God asked him to do. He wasn't holding on to a particular outcome. Rather, he was holding on to God. Abraham's waiting strengthened his faith and taught him the ways of God and showed him the faithfulness of God. So perhaps God is making me or you wait for the same reasons that he was making Abraham wait for, making him wait so he could forge our faith and so that uh, we would uh, be uh, attractive and attentive to his voice and we would deepen our relationship and solidify our trust and prepare us for greater ministry and transform us into his likeness. Listen, in retrospect, I can see that wait is probably the most precious answer God could have given Abraham. It makes us cling to him rather than cling to a certain outcome. Oh, help me preach for just a few minutes. God knows what I need. How many know I don't know what I need? He sees the future. I don't see the future. His perspective is eternal. Mine is not. He will give me what is best for me when it is best for me. I think it was Pastor Paul Tripp, author, writer. He said, waiting is not just about what I get at the end of the wait, but about who I become while I wait. So let's not believe that lie that says God is not doing anything while we wait because Scripture disproves that lie. It lets us know God is on the move. huh? God is active and He is at work even while we wait. Somebody say praise God. The second lie is this. We believe this second lie and it says that God has forgotten us and has forgotten our prayer. Look at Luke 1.13. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Mm, hallelujah. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John. Thus saith the Lord, dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me. Verse 25. Elizabeth says, To take away my reproach among men. See, so we get this... the the divine naming of this child. Now, I want you to understand, back in Bible times, people just didn't pick names for their children that sounded cute. Hello. They didn't just pick names that were popular, name them after popular celebrities or entertainers. They didn't just say, if I've got a girl, I'm going to name her Beyonce or Rihanna. If I have a boy, I'm going to name him Bruno or LeBron. No, people in Bible times pick names for their children to communicate something of the hope that they had for their children. They were trying to express something of their dreams for their child's destiny. And Zechariah is one of the most common names in the Bible. And here's what it means. Remembered by the Lord. His wife Elizabeth's name means God keeps his promises. So God providentially brings two people together, one whose name means remembered by the Lord and the other whose name means God keeps his promises. And they have a son after all of these years. And the son's name is to be John. Now, John's name means the Lord has been gracious or the Lord has shown favor. So God brings these folks together to communicate a simple message that is simply this. God never forgets. God always remembers his promises. He is always completely reliable. He always keeps his word, and he will be gracious unto you 
and unto me. He will show us his favor. Oh, hallelujah. What does it mean to have God remember you? It's not that God goes through this mental process in which, you know, he forgot something and now it all of a sudden comes to mind. No, to have God remember you throughout Scripture is to have God act on your behalf. Hmm? To answer your prayer, to have God remember you, is to have God come to your aid and intervene in your situation. And when the psalmist says over and over again in the book of Psalms, he says, Lord, remember us. He's saying, Lord, I, I need you to pay attention. I need you to come to our aid. You know, there is only one thing, let me tell you this, that God forgets. Hmm? He forgets the sin that's been confessed to him. I said there's only one thing that God forgets. Somebody ought to rejoice right there. Because the promise of the new covenant purchased for us by the blood of Jesus is Hebrews 8, 12. And it says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Thank God that there is one thing that God forgets and that is our sins. The only the enemy always wants to throw up our confessed sins back in our faces and say, hey, you need to remember this or you need to remember that. But God says, I've forgotten that. Hey, I said, I've forgotten that. But what God never forgets is our prayers. We read in verse 13 and 25, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. You'll call his name John. And when the angel says to Zechariah, your prayer has been heard, Zechariah's first thought is probably, which prayer? Which prayer? What was Zechariah praying at that time? Well, in the immediate context, Zechariah is in the temple, and he was in there praying and interceding for the nation of Israel's deliverance. He would have been praying that Israel would have been saved and that God would go to work on Israel's behalf in, in sending a Messiah. But I think more is meant here in the phrase, your prayers have been heard than just the salvation of Israel. I believe the angel is referring to some old prayers. I said some old prayers that Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed years before this uh, that they had long forgotten about. Prayers in which they cried out alone in the earlier years of their marriage as they come together and they prayed, God, give us a child. And at the right moment when Zechariah was in the temple, having been chosen by Lot to, to offer the incense before God, as the smoke of the incense is coming before the Lord, the angel says, Zechariah, God says he remembered your prayer. The prayers that you prayed years ago, you and your wife, you thought you, you would, it would never happen. To, listen, Zechariah, I want you to know I haven't forgotten those prayers. I haven't forgotten the prayers that you're praying right now for the salvation of Israel either. But I remember the prayers you prayed years ago that you even forgot about. Oh, somebody ought to shout praise God. Why? Because we serve a God who remembers every prayer we pray. You know, when we pray for a certain thing to happen, relational or medical healing to take place, a loved one to be saved or marriage partner to come along for us or, or a child to be born or a door of ministry to open, often it doesn't appear that God is doing anything. Here, he's not answering our prayers. Sometimes uh, we begin to think we just need to move on. And don't get me wrong, sometimes moving on is a healthy thing. In some circumstances, because how many know you can't always obsess or pound yourself into the ground over things you don't have? Hello. Sometimes we just need to be content with what God has, has given us and provided. And sometimes we have to say, well, this is something God has chosen in his wisdom and, I, and, and he's withheld it from me. And I don't know why, but I, I still am called to love God anyway and, and be kind to other people and, and find a meaningful place of serving God. But listen, friends, more times than I can count, God comes along and he surprises us.
And he says, I'm going to answer a prayer that you prayed so long ago that you have forgotten about. A prayer that you prayed maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Zechariah, I'm going to fulfill your name, which is the Lord remembers. Elizabeth, I'm going to fulfill your name, which means God keeps his promises. And I'm going to give you a son, John, which means God has shown us favor. Friend, has it ever occurred to you that God never forgets a single prayer prayed? Hmm? We forget. God doesn't forget. Has it occurred to you that the blessing that you have in your life right now has come to you simply because you prayed for it probably years ago? Hmm? Let me make this personal. I believe that virtually every one of us who is a believer right now, we're in the kingdom of God because someone prayed us in. Hello. Maybe it was a praying mother, a father, a grandparent. Maybe in your case it was a friend or a teammate or a roommate or a spouse or a sibling or a pastor or a coworker. Listen, sometimes maybe years before you made a decision to actually give your life to Christ, somebody was praying for you. God doesn't ever forget those prayers. As I said, during times of waiting, it's easy to believe lies about God. We believe, first of all, God isn't doing anything while, while he is on the move. Secondly, we believe God has forgotten us when he always remembers us. And then finally, as I close, lie number three. See, God measures greatness the way we do. That's the lie we believe. That God measures greatness the way we do. I want you to look at this. Let me say this before I go back to the text as Sister Jones comes to the piano. God has his own measure of greatness. It says, the angel says to Zacharias in verse 15 that this son John, notice what he says, will be great in the sight of the Lord. That right there tells us that God measures people differently than we do. Because what is great in God's sight is often overlooked by the media and by us. What we talk about all the time and what grabs the headlines and consumes all the oxygen in the room, so to speak, is hardly noticed by God. It's nothing in the sight of God. Because Herod, everybody say Herod, Herod whose name is found at the beginning of this passage was called Herod the, hello, the Great. He was called Herod the Great by the people of his day. But it's interesting that the Bible never refers to Herod as the Great. Never. All of Herod's achievements were nothing in the sight of God. And yet baby boy John, born to Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age, John was said to be great in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. During times of waiting, it is easy to begin to believe that because people don't notice us and we're not doing things that are catching everybody's attention, we're, real, we're thinking that God doesn't notice us or anything we do and that we're overlooked and that we're neglected by God. But can I tell somebody here this morning, God sees you. I said God notices you. And he... Oh, and there are many of you that the Lord looks at this morning and says you are great in my sight. Why? Because you've held on to the promise. You've held on. I'm feeling better. I said you prayed that prayer and you just didn't forget it. But you said, God, here it is again. I'm going to trust you another time. Oh, praise God. I got to quit. I'm going into overtime. Lord, have mercy. The roast, you smell it, it's burning. Stand with me. The truth is, 
God is doing something while we wait, beloved. Turn to your neighbor one more time and tell him God is on the move. God is on the move. I said God is on the move. Hallelujah. God is on the move and God has not forgotten about us. Because the truth is, He always remembers us. And listen, friends, God's not through with Broadway Assembly. He's brought us this far. And He's got a purpose for every one of you under the sound of my voice. Uh, Listen, God has His own measure of greatness. So I want us today to rebuke the lies. Uh, I said rebuke the lies uh, that have attacked our mind while we are waiting. And say, God is still on the move. I say, praise God. Praise God. Raise your hands and praise Him right where you're at. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're here this morning, you've prayed a prayer. Maybe it's a prayer for a loved one. Maybe it's a prayer for a family member and friend. I want you to just join me and stand across the front. I want you, if you've prayed a prayer and you have not, as of yet today, received an answer and you're waiting, would you just step out of the seat and come and stand across the front? Because we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray for all those that are in the waiting room. Oh, hallelujah. And we're going to pray against the lies. Hello. We're going to pray against the lies that the devil has sown in our minds trying to get us to doubt God and to doubt his faithfulness. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit right here. I feel the Holy Spirit, church. I want you to agree with me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody this morning can leave with your mind at ease and with some freedom in your minds. In Jesus' name. I want us to rebuke the enemy that would love to destroy our faith and distract our faith. And let's continue to pour out our hearts and say, God, you never forget one single prayer prayed. It's it's always recorded. And so, Lord, we're going to believe you. We're going to trust you. That's it. They're coming. Anybody else? Anybody else? I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want you to pray with me, and I want us to begin praying right here. And I want us to begin by praying this simple thought. God, I know I can't see you at the time, but I believe you're on the move. God, I cannot see you right now, but I am believing you are on the move. Oh, hallelujah, somebody's faith is being built right back up. Brick by brick, block by block, somebody's faith is rising. In Jesus' name, God, I I don't see you right now, but I know you're you're working. I know you're working. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Go ahead, church, go ahead. I'm believing God to work right here. Somebody's faith is going to be strengthened in the waiting room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Oh, I trust you, Lord. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody's faith is rising right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name for that family, for that family member, for that loved one. Oh, God, for that circumstance financially, I'm believing you for the answer. And while I'm in the waiting room, I'm going to rejoice because you're on the move. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In here right now, Lord, we commit. We commit. We commit to you. Oh, hallelujah. There's folks that's praying. There's folks that's crying out to God. And I feel the Holy Spirit stepping down right here in this front. He's touching hearts and lives. Would you just reach out to him right where you're at? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, I'm trusting you. I'm believing you right now for that need. I'm believing you right now for that need. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.